Great to be back with you, and uh, your presence is very much appreciated. Good to see you here, those of you who are here in person, and also those who are watching online. We welcome you, and it's good to be together in this way. This is an exciting time here at Central, uh, not the least of which reason is we have a gospel meeting starting next week with uh, Brother Billy Smith, and uh, this is going to be a traditional gospel meeting. We've tried to keep this one very straightforward. We haven't had a gospel meeting here in two and a half years because of the uh, virus situation, uh, but Gospel meetings have always historically been a big part of our work here at Central. Uh, we've had some tremendous speakers over the years, and I know that you'll be pleased with uh, the lessons that Brother Billy will be presenting. So keep that in your plans starting next Sunday, May 8th. I think, incidentally, there are a few spots left on that meal sign-up list if you would like to host Billy in your home or at a restaurant. Uh, he and Joan will be happy to join you for a meal in that way. We had a good trip, uh, visited with uh, the board of trustees and the meetings that occurred on Friday, and I will, Lord willing, I'll be getting you a full report in next week's bulletin. For those who are interested in keeping up with that and reading it, I think you'll find it very encouraging. We also visited with Marvina's cousin out in uh, Little Rock area and her family, and uh, they are graduates of Harding University. I want to ask your prayers for this university, one of our brotherhood schools, as uh, they are beginning a new president. Dr. Mike Williams begins June 1st. He is, has currently and is currently the president of Faulkner University. And everything I know about him is very good. And so we're looking for great things there from uh, his leadership. You know, a, co a college president has a tremendous responsibility, especially in our brotherhood schools. And so we want to pray for Dr. Williams as he begins his work at Harding on June 1st. Coming back, we also visited in Kentucky with Ronnie Stubblefield and his family. And they took us around to see some of the damage that occurred there from the tornadoes back in December. You remember the congregation here stepped up and said, we'd like to send you some support, some financial support. But by that time, a number of congregations in that area had risen to that need. And that basically the church there said, thank you. Uh, we appreciate it deeply. And please uh, don't send anything. We're, we're okay. We're okay. But if, if we need something, we will call. I got to see some sites that were kind of heart-rending. Let me show you a picture or two. These are what, ha what trees, healthy trees, look like after that tornado went through. That tornado was about a mile wide and just bounced along like a lawnmower for 100 miles. And this was the result in the path. That is what's left of somebody's home. Now we're, you know what, four months, five, five months later. So you'll see that there's been some gathering of debris and some cleanup. If you look closely at that person's house, you'll see the roof is torn up and their ante TV antenna tower is lying on the roof. Uh, this is a church building that was damaged. Uh, but you see that they have erected a tent there in the background and they're meeting in the tent. This is what a tree looks like when it is just twisted off. Amazing power. But in the background, there's several men there constructing a new home on the site where that one was removed. So there are some signs of rebuilding. And again, on behalf of those brethren, thank you for your prayers. Continue to remember those brothers and sisters in Christ. I know that the elders in the church there spent weeks uh, driving around on country roads, visiting people, handing out supplies, chainsaws, new steel chainsaws, and whatever else was needed that the church could provide. And it was so very much appreciated in that community. You know, when we think of sharing news, and I'm especially thinking now of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the privilege of preaching the gospel. I can't tell you how much 
to me, it means to be able to preach the Word of God and to a group of people who show their respect and appreciation so often, so many ways. Oftentimes when I'm preaching, I will say something like, I don't want you to believe what I'm preaching because I say so. Um, I, I see the look that our visitors have sometimes when we present the plan of salvation. You know, how the scriptures teach that we must not only hear and believe the gospel, repent of our sins, but we must be baptized into Christ. That's what the Bible says. But I don't want you to believe that because I say so. I want you to search the scriptures and look at your own Bible because as we mentioned in class this morning here in the auditorium, ultimately, ultimately, all of us are going to stand or fall individually before God on the great day of judgment. It's not going to be a case of, well, Brother Bob said this is the way it is, so that's why I live that way. No. If you search your Bible and you find that something is different from what I'm saying, by all means, you follow the book because that's our judge. Jesus said, the words that I spoke, the same shall judge him in the last day. So when do we believe people? And when do we not believe? Maybe that's just as important of a question. I like these verses that Tristan read for us from John 4. You remember that the, the Samaritan woman had had a very uh, profound encounter with Jesus Christ. And he had looked into her life and told her some very telling, interesting facts about her life that the only way he could have known these things is, as she said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And I perceive that there is something more than meets the eye to you. And indeed, that was the case. He told her about worship and how the true worshipers would worship in spirit and in truth. And when she went back to the villages of Samaria and, and her hometown, no doubt she, she published, she broadcast what had happened to her. She didn't keep it a secret. And so John tells us that many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, now we believe not because of thy speaking, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. With those words in your mind, let me ask you a question. What is it that you believe? What convinces you that this I'm going to believe? Or on the other hand, when do you rule it out and say, I'm not going to believe that? What makes the difference for you? What convinces you to believe something? Is it science? You know, if science comes out, and I'm going to use that word in quotes, you understand? You know, if, if science says something, do you, do you just accept that to be the case? Maybe it is your friends, and particularly now young people, to whom friends and peers are so very, very critical. And we go through ages where peer pressure is very, very strong. What, what do we do when our friends say this is the way it is? Maybe that's the thing that causes you to believe. Or maybe it's the culture in which we live. You know, the American culture is very, very pervasive and powerful. It influences how people live, how we dress, how we wear our hair, the other styles of day-to-day -day living, uh, common conventions are often determined by culture. Maybe it's the news. You turn on the evening news, or maybe you're listening to the news throughout the day, or you catch the, 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 the radio news every hour, or whatever it is. Maybe you're getting your news from the internet completely. You don't ever turn on cable news. But anyway, wh whatever the news source is, is that the thing that you believe? I am often amazed at the disparity, the difference 
in news stations, and I, I will, I will uh, test that sometimes. I'll, I'll, I'll watch the, the, the big news of the day on one station, and I'll flip over and watch it on another. The difference is astounding. Is news the thing that convinces you to believe something? Maybe it is your school. The school that you are now attending. What your teacher says. Or maybe the school that you previously attended. Maybe that from which you got your degree or your training. You remember the teachers there said this is the way it is. Is that what convinces you? What is it that convinces you to believe something? May I share with you what I would call a common mistake that we make sometimes, I think, in personal evangelism. In doing personal work and trying to share the gospel with others on a personal level, which incidentally, as you know, this is the critical indicator of the spiritual growth of the church is how much personal work is going on. How much are we reaching out and sharing the gospel as Jesus commanded? Remember he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or make disciples of all the nations. You remember that, the Great Commission? But there's a mistake that we often make in personal evangelism. We sit down with somebody and we get into a religious discussion and the first thing you know, they ask a good question. And the question will often be put in terms like this. Well, yes, but what do you think about such and such? What do you think about women preachers? What do you think about mechanical instruments or musical instruments? The bands. And before you know it, because we have such strong emotional feelings on these and other subjects, we sometimes answer something like this. We say, well, I think, and then we go on and give an answer. I think such and such. Sometimes even in our Bible classes, when we make comments, or in teaching classes, there is a temptation sometimes, a tendency to make that mistake. Well, I think such and such. It is a common mistake made in personal evangelism. This morning, based on these verses that we've seen, may I suggest to you a better approach? A better approach and much more effective in leading other people to Jesus Christ. I want to give this to you in portions. The first one I would identify this way. It would be better if we first of all would recognize where the power of the gospel is. The power is in the word of God. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, God, through the prophet, makes this amazing statement. Now, now listen carefully to the implications of this statement. God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. The word void means useless, of no effect. If I were to go out into the parking lot right after services... Noticing that there was, say, a flat tire on one of the cars, and I walk over there, or maybe I go down into my garage, and there's my car parked there, as happened to me when we got back from our trip. There's the car, and the left rear tire's flat. If I were to get a hold of that car with all of my might and, and try to raise that up so that I could change that tire, I would be doing something void. In vain. It would have no benefit whatsoever. God is saying, when my word goes out of my mouth, it will not return unto me void. 
But notice further, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah is letting us know that God's word is not void, is not in vain. God's word will accomplish what God wants it to do. Do you realize, we think back about the creation, all that we see around us in the material universe, the earth, the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything on the face of the earth that we can observe was created by the word of God. Think of that, the power of God's word. We need to recognize, folks, that when we're teaching somebody the gospel, the power is in the Bible, the word of God. Never sit down at a Bible study without a Bible. Now, it may not be a traditional Bible. It may not look like this one. It may be a tablet or an, an, an iPod or on your smartphone, your iPhone or whatever it is. It, it may not be traditional, but it's going to be there. Because the power is in the Word of God. But now notice second. Draw attention to the Bible. Don't act like the Bible is sort of a, a, a decoration, a potted plant, okay? It, we, we sort of put that there off to the side, but we're not really going to pay any attention to it. No, I want the person that I'm trying to share the gospel with to know that I know and they know that the Bible is right there. Because we're interested in hearing God's word on this question. You know, when Jesus went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 9 that there were three of his apostles there with him. They were the so-called inner three, Peter, James, and John. And he was... In Mark's words, he was transfigured before them. And they saw there, standing with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets. Figures out of their past that they, for whom they had tremendous respect. And they're standing there, and Jesus is right in their midst. What would your reaction be if you were Peter, James, or John? There's this man that we have been following, that we've come to know and respect and have such great affection for, and now suddenly he is surrounded by the greatest figures in our history, Moses and Elijah. The text says, verse 2, And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, bringeth him up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became glistening, exceeding white, so as no fuller on earth could whiten them. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now watch the reaction of Peter, verse, nine, or verse 5. And Peter answereth and saith to Jesus, Rabbi, or teacher, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Sounds like a great idea, if you're thinking in human terms, doesn't it? We're going to make three monuments, three tabernacles. One for you, Jesus, of course, we're not going to leave you out, but we're going to make one for Moses and we're going to make one for Elijah. It's great that we're here. Now watch the rest of this passage. There came a cloud, verse 7, overshadowing them, and there came a voice out of the cloud, this 
is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And suddenly, looking round about, they saw no one anymore save Jesus only. Jesus only with themselves. What powerful lesson has just been taught? What I think doesn't matter. What Peter thought doesn't matter. Or what James or John might have suggested. The, the, the best inventions and ideas of men, they fall away by comparison. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. When we are sharing the gospel with other people, we need to draw attention to what God says. This is the Bible here. This is the word of God. What I think makes no difference. I consciously, when I make a comment in a Bible study, I try to avoid the phrase, I think. It's not because that's a bad phrase or that it's always inappropriate. But I think it can be a gateway to the wrong way of thinking. I just said, I think that it can be a gateway. Because what's happening there is I'm relying on my own wisdom, my own judgment, rather than upon the word of God. That's why these sermons have scriptures interfused throughout them. That's why there are passages from the Word of God to back up these points. And when we're studying the Word of God, that would be a better approach. Draw attention to the Bible. It's not about what I think. And then the third aspect is this. We need to emphasize respect for the Bible. At every opportunity, as the discussion advances, emphasize respect for the Bible. Now, it's not just in what we say, incidentally. It's how we act. It's what we do. It's, it's what we practice. We're teaching somebody the gospel in a personal Bible study, and they ask us a question. Well, what do you do at the Central Church of Christ where you attend? What do you do? So we tell them. Doesn't it stand to reason that they're going to judge our words by our actions? I think it was Emerson who said, I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. The way we conduct ourselves in our personal life the way we talk, the way we act, whether we're showing respect to other people, whether we are being demeaning to other people, whether we are practicing New Testament Christianity ourselves or not, that is going to emphasize or not emphasize our respect for the Bible and explain that the Bible is God's word. Remember that passage that we looked at not long ago from 2 John 9 where he said, Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. You see, if I open the Bible and I get to read, but then I just leave it behind and take off on my own opinions and my own think-sos, I no longer have God. I'm getting out ahead of him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Explain that the Bible is God's word. Next, let them, let them come to these conclusions on their own. We tend, I think, sometimes in our Bible studies to get a little frustrated, maybe a little too quick with people, and we, we say, well, can't you see it? Don't you see what this verse says? Let them reach the conclusion. 
In this passage from John chapter 4, these people are saying, we have heard for ourselves. This woman came back all excited. Man, you ought to see this man. You've got to talk to him. I think he may be the Messiah. They went out and they listened to him, but what convinced them was not her saying so. They came to that conclusion themselves. We have heard for ourselves. It reminds me of the statement uh, of the Bereans there in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Luke says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Because they received the word with all eagerness, this is the English Standard Version, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They didn't just take the preacher's word for it. They took their Bible at home, or what they had in the semblance of a Bible, and it didn't look like this, but they were able to check that and search the scriptures. They searched those Old Testament scriptures that they had. And they saw, hey, this is so. What he is saying is correct. They reached that conclusion instead of having it pushed upon them by somebody else. And then finally, we're going to have to allow time for understanding. People do not respond to the gospel on our timetable. Sometimes I wish they did. There have been times I have preached my heart out in a gospel sermon. I knew there were people in the auditorium who needed to respond, needed to respond now. And I'll stand here at the front and I'm waiting. I'm, I'm, I'm longing to extend my hand and to say, welcome back, welcome home, or welcome to obedience to Jesus Christ. But people aren't always ready on my timetable. Paul would say, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. At what stage of obedience are you? There is one other point I want to leave you with, which is very, very important. If you are teaching somebody involved in a Bible study or personal evangelism of some kind, pray for them. Pray that God would open doors of opportunity for you and that he would allow them to be a lover of truth. Pray that they will approach that with an open heart and open mind that the gospel might have free course in their life. We have a personal evangelism seminar coming up in the fall. We're going to have opportunity to practice some of these suggestions. We have a gospel meeting starting next week with Billy Smith. Great opportunity to bring a friend, to invite someone to come and to hear the gospel preached. I guarantee you one thing, knowing Billy, he will preach the gospel. But will we have ready and attentive ears here ready to hear and receive it? I hope so. And I hope that these thoughts are helpful when we remember that Samaritan woman and the effects of the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ. Are you here this morning needing to respond to the invitation? Needing to come in obedience to become a Christian or to return if unfaithful? Do you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ? If so, whatever the need may be, we stand ready here at the front to assist if, if we may humbly do so. Would you come while together we stand and sing?